Okay, members, Ms. Uh, Pam Cameron has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary clerk. Please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health how he plans to meet demand for GP appointments and mitigate obstacles encountered by patients seeking to contact their local doctor or practice during the COVID-19 pandemic. I call the Minister of Health. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to stress that GP practices are open um, providing face-to-face -face appointments for those patients who are, who are assessed as requiring them. I have made sure all practices have been provided with a supply of PPE to allow them to do so safely. And information from the Health and Social Care Board shows that figures indicate that the number of face-to-face -face contacts have increased from approximately 4,500 contacts per day in mid-May to just over 8,000 contacts per day by mid-August. Members will be aware that GPs also have a contractual responsibility to provide core services to the registered patients, and the current pandemic does not negate this. GPs will, however, use their clinical judgment to decide how best to prioritise patients to provide this core service whilst maintaining patient safety. GP practices are currently operating a telephone first triage system, which allows patients to seek medical advice from their GP for both routine and urgent problems. The GP then uses their clinical judgment to decide if the patient can be safely managed over the telephone or whether a face-to-face -face appointment is required. There are measures in place to assist GPs to identify those patients who may be infected with coronavirus. These patients can then be referred for face-to-face -face assessment to one of the primary care COVID-19 centres. This ensures that these patients do not attend the GP practice or community pharmacy and are seen in an appropriate environment, as well as ensuring that GP services are maintained with minimum disruption. Those COVID centres are now seeing the highest number of referrals since early May, and it is increasing. The Health and Social Care Board wrote to GP practices in Northern Ireland on the 30th of July, asking them that, if this had not been done recently, practices should undertake a review of arrangements for patients accessing their services in order to ensure that they are continuing to provide services at times that are appropriate to meet the needs of patients. Practices were advised to communicate to patients about the practice services that are available and how to access them with the recommendation that these communications make clear that GP practices are open. On the 7th of September, Mr. Speaker, GP leaders from the Health and Social Care Board, the Royal College of General Practitioners, and the British Medical Association issued a statement to reassure patients that whilst patients may be seen in a different way by phone or video link, GP practices are still open to treat patients, provide advice, and issue prescriptions. Similar communication was also issued to MLAs. Finally, Mr. Speaker, members will also be aware that GPs. <coughs> are responsible for the administration of the majority of the flu vaccines given during the annual flu programme. Given the importance of this year's vaccine, along with the significant extended lists of those groups who are eligible for it, GPs are already making plans for this, which may include hiring larger venues or arranging additional flu vaccination sessions. As part of that, earlier today, I have signed off an additional £1 million funding for general practice. Mr Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to relay the message to all those listening. GP practices are open. It may be slightly different at the moment, but if people have symptoms or an unexplained illness, or they have any reason to be concerned, then I would encourage them to, in the first, pick up the phone, because GPs are there, and they are there to help. Thank you. And I call Palm Cameron to ask a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer um, so far. And at the outset, um, let me be very clear that I absolutely do value the work of our GPs and understand that the need to operate with much caution in order to ensure GP services remain um, in place and, and open. Um, Minister, my office has been inundated, as I'm sure most MLAs here um, have been too, with complaints around access to GPs. And we're entering the winter flu season now, and um, it's unlikely that we're going to avoid a second wave of COVID-19. Um, it's imperative that GPs are seen to be open for business and not just for emergency cases only. Um, it may well be a perception, but it is certainly a problem for the EDs and indeed the pharmacists who feel like they are bearing the brunt of the lack of access to physical or remote um, to primary care. 
So does the Minister um, recognise the very serious concerns, especially in the case of the more vulnerable and very elderly patients, and that some people aren't always uh, as capable of fully communi communicating their health problems to um, their GP by telephone, and that more availability of face-to-face -face GP appointments are absolutely necessary to properly diagnose whatever their issue may be? And I, I thank the member for, for the comments in regards to the pressure the GPs are currently under, as are our, our primary care providers. But I also thank her for bringing this urgent question to the House today, because I think it is important for the specific, of, or specific issue that she raised, is that of perception. And I think it was, that was particularly useful when the, the Royal College, the BMA, issued that joint letter uh, and that joint communication at the start of last week to reassure patients that our GP practices are still open. In regards for that, that cohort that can't use telephone triage or isn't comfortable in using that, it's been clear that GPs should be open and accessible to those patients who need that face-to-face -face appointment. So in regards to that and ever-increasing accessibility to do the face-to-face, -face, I think, in, in my opening answer, uh, we realise you know, the, the number of face-to-face -face contacts that have been had uh, in, in the last number of months, and that continues to increase. But we want it to be done safely, both for the GPs, for their staff, but especially for the patients as well. But they've always been clear, and our GPs have been clear as well, that for those people who need to see them face-to-face, -face, we'll get that face-to-face -face, face -face appointment. I call Colm Gillernay. Barmy Agat, can call you, and thank you, Minister, for coming today to answer these questions. Um, like the Deputy Chair of the Health Committee, I have been, and I know all MLAs are getting uh, increasing uh, anxiety around the access to GPs. Could the Minister advise um, my colleague Martina Anderson asked in July in relation to what steps were being taken? Could the Minister advise what steps are now in place to improve the situation and also to deal with the issue of? flu vaccinations given the winter months are coming in and distancing requirements? Okay, um, I'll answer, <coughs> sorry, I'll answer the, the, mem or the Chair's second question first, and I covered that in my opening statement. Earlier today, we have been working with the, the BMA Committee of General Practitioners and the Royal College of General Practitioners on how we support them in delivering the flu vaccine, because we've always been clear that the uptake of flu vaccine, especially this year, will be critical. So we've been working with them as to how that can be done. One size will not fit all general practices, so that's why we're making that additional funding available today, both for the supply you know, of equipment to need the hire of additional venues, because we will be looking, you know, drive-through centres, large spaces, so we can ensure that our GP services and our GP practices don't become overcrowded and social distancing um, doesn't become a problem. In regards to how we address um, the issue that. Uh, the member's party colleague issued what the, the issue that the, the vice chair has raised here today. I, I think it's about engagement with the general protect, practitioners, with the BMA, and, and all those other representative bodies, just to reassure them um, that they have this house's support in ensuring that the delivery of the service is done as safely as possible. But we would encourage them to make sure that those people who do need that face-to-face -face appointment can get it. So it's about operating through the electronic changes that we've seen, but also make, making sure that they have the support and the ability to use their facilities, the additional PPE, to ensure that we can get anybody who, who needs that face-to-face that -face appointment uh, gets it. Because I've said in this House before, it's not always the reason that somebody goes in to the GP is the reason they go to see the GP. It's the comment as they turn with their back to go out the door and say, by the way, there's one other thing, doctor, I'd like to ask you about. Our doctors know that, our GPs know that, and I don't think there's any of them who are deliberately not seeing patients, and I think that's a perception that is important that we dispel today, Mr Speaker, as well, because our GPs are there to help, and they want to help us in the nature of the profession they're in. Okay, and I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his uh, attendance and answer to the questions. It is indeed uh, an increasing uh, and more common complaint that we're getting about people having access to their, their GP. It is creating a lot of frustration and worry, and especially amongst those in our older community. 
You have mentioned the COVID centres that were there, and I'm just wondering, are they having any direct impact on the ability for GPs to be able to deliver um, their services, or are there some mitigations in place uh, for them to have that cover in their service whenever they're out covering the COVID centres? And while you say that they are certainly at their most busy from last May, for some of those COVID GP centres, that was a very, very low workload. And is there any way of them sharing some of the burden that there might be in some of the GP centres? Um, and I thank the member, because I think I do remember when um, we last discussed this, he was one of the ones who was actually advocating that we close um, the COVID centres. We didn't at that stage. Uh, and I think that has proven to be the right decision, because we're actually seeing a significant increase as to the number of people who are now presenting to COVID centres, so we can ensure that safe access to GP services for those people who need a safe access, one that's not threatened by, by COVID or the potential of, of COVID positive patients. For the week ending um, the 15th of September, those COVID centres saw 733 people across Northern Ireland. The week before, they saw 427. Now, that's nearly a 100% increase in the period of one week. And where we're seeing that most significantly is the areas that we've now, we've now put in additional restrictions in. So for the centre, it's actually in Ballymena. You know, that, that weekend on the 15th of September saw 65 patients. The week before it was 20. So those COVID centres are proving useful. Our GPs in general are supportive of them. There are some GPs who, who are reticent about them, don't see them as being fit for purpose. But that's, that, that's in any nature, any walk of life, any profession, there'll be always, always looks people who, who, who don't see the benefit of, of a COVID centre. But we're getting the information and, and the guidance I'm getting from the BMA, from the Royal College of General Practitioners, COVID centres are proving useful because it allows GP practices to stay open for non-COVID patients or non-COVID uh, symptomatic patients. I call Paula Bradshaw. Uh, thank you. Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister. Um, at the all-party group on cancer um, this afternoon, one of your departmental officials advised that there has been a 17.5% reduction in red flag referrals from GP surgeries. And I'm wondering, are you going to put in place some temporary short-term measures to try and um, reverse that and, and get the people in through the system? Thank you. Um, I thank the member. I haven't had a readout yet from that, that all-party group, but the departmental official who was, who was attending, I think it was the chief nursing officer, probably was, was attending that group today. So any information that comes from an all-party group gets fed back in. But in regards to the red flag referrals coming from GPs, it's one of the things that I was always adamant about, even during the height of the pandemic. If anybody needed to be seen, they should be going to the GP to be seen to make sure that they got that referral into the system. Because one of the things that we have seen through the pandemic is a far closer and a far better working relationship between primary care and secondary care uh, and I want that to maintain so that when we look at how those referrals to be made there's a personal understanding there's even a personal contact that we we have lost within our health service over a period of time that the GP doesn't know who the consultant or the local consultant is and they don't have a direct line of contact that has been broken down in the large over the past number of months and I think it's something we can build on to improve our service. I call Jim Allister. I don't share the Minister's confidence that all is as well as he says with the GP service. We've all had cases of people despairing about not being able to see their GP. One case from my office comes to mind, a lady who had been waiting for weeks to see her GP contacted my office. She shouldn't have to contact an MLA to get to see her GP, saw her GP the next morning. The symptoms detected meant she was rushed to treatment for cancer at the city hospital. Now, how many cases, what sort of a harvest of cancer cases are we going to have post-COVID? That, I think, is a real concern, and I think the impediment to ready access to GPs is contributing to that. If the member doesn't think I share those concerns, he's mistaken. That is why I'm trying to get all the parts of the health service up and operational, operational that we can, but also done in a safe way. In regards to the constituent that the member refers to, should not have to, have to wait 
that number of weeks to see a GP. That's what I'm saying here today. And the guidance and, and, and the support that they're there for GPs who operate as independent contractors to to the service, our guidance is clear. See as many people as you can. See them face to face because that's when if someone needs to be seen face to face, they should be. And that's why the triage system is there. That's why that personal contact is there. And as I said before, there's not a GP out there that I believe that is doing anything intentionally that would deny a patient access to the medical services that they provide and they need. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I, I was uh, attended a meeting at lunchtime with uh, some representatives of GPs, and they, they certainly appear to be working harder than ever. And, and I got the impression that morale remains high, and certainly their professional dedication is continuing to shine through. Uh, I'm sure the Minister recognises the sterling work been carried out by this sector of the health service. Uh, and would he agree that COVID centres are actually taking more pressure off GP practices? rather than imposing additional unacceptable work on practices? Yeah, and again, I thank the member for his acknowledgement for the work that, that GPs are doing. And, and I think they themselves will recognise it's not perfect out there at this moment in time, because many of them aren't doing what they want to be doing in regards to getting that, that, that face-to-face -face contact with, with every patient that comes forward and does present to each practice. And in the, I think in the answers that I gave to, to Colin McGrath earlier on in regards to the numbers, when we saw, see that almost doubled um, from the week end on the 8th of September to the week end of the 15th of September, shows the service that those COVID centres actually do supply because it's a very specific cohort of people who come through the triage system are identified as having COVID symptoms that are sent there. So in the fact that there were 733 people triaged through our, our primary care service to those COVID centres in one week, almost double the previous week, shows that they are providing a service that keeps the rest of the GP practices open to those people who are presenting with non-COVID symptoms. I call Claire Sugden. Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for responding to the House. Um, as a follow-up to your comments to Mr Alistair, I don't think this is about intent of what GPs will or won't do. I think it's about capacity. And you spoke of um, uh, the triage system in, in, in a number of your responses. Chance would be a fine thing if you could actually get through to that system. I'm hearing daily reports where uh, constituents are unable to get through on a phone call, maybe taking them up to a week to actually make that way through. And when they do get through, they're being told that those appointment slots have been entirely filled, and then they're being referred to a &E. So what, in effect, we are doing is creating a bottleneck in other services, whether it is a &E, whether it is pharmacy, or whether it's other uh, uh, local uh, provision. And I appreciate what the Minister is saying, and I do recognise the challenges that everyone is facing in respect of um, the, the response to COVID-19. However, how is the Minister ensuring that GP surgeries are fulfilling their contractual responsibilities and not uh, passing those services on elsewhere, which is putting pressure that we may need to bring you back to the House to discuss at another time? And I think you know, what the member refers to is our, our urgent and emergency care procedure and how how the review of that ties hand in hand with how primary care interacts and supports with secondary care. And I think, as I said earlier on in an answer, is the breaking down of those silos. That is something that we need to work on and ensure is embedded in our health service. In accessing GP services and that continual having to phone, it's, it's not good enough. The GPs themselves know that. And it's about you know, the, the time that's now been taken up by receptionists, likely triaging as well. So there's a piece of work going on. That I to, to further enhance that through, through the GP provision. That has been worked on with the Royal College and with the British Medical Association as well, to ensure that what we do is in step with what our GP services want, because there is no point in us as a department delivering a service that is non-deliverable within our GP practices. Because of, I think one thing that every member of this House will realise and acknowledge is the personal understanding that a GP has of their own patients is paramount as to how they are guided and how they are treated in the first instance. Call Paul Given. Speaker, and, and can I thank uh, my colleague Pam Cameron for bringing this timely question. Um, access, as members have commented, is an issue, 
But there is a, an issue as well that I think the Minister I know will be cognizant of, but that is those constituents of mine who, because of the messages that have been communicated around protecting the NHS, ensuring capacity, they believe that when they have a problem that they feel they can manage themselves, are not presenting themselves and are not contacting the GP. I think it's critical that messaging that goes out that in every measure that's taken to contain COVID-19, that there is also a message that people must come forward, that their good intention is leading to very poor outcomes, and for some, that will be fatal. No, and, and I, appreciate, I appreciate the members' comments, because you know, it follows on from the Vice Chair of the Health Committee. It also follows on from the very clear messaging that myself, the Chief Medical Officer, we were giving at, at the daily briefings. You know, if you needed to see a GP, if you needed to attend hospital, please do it, because what we don't want is a backlog of those cases building up uh, within our health service, especially at primary care. And I think that is why uh, the interaction and the statement that came out from the British Medical Association, the Health and Social Care Board, and the Royal College of GPs at the start of last week, and making clear to the general public that it wasn't me saying it. This was the representative bodies of general practitioners saying it. We are open for business. Please come and see us if you need to. I call Orlea Flynn. Scarmy, I got last time call you. Um, could I ask the minister if he has any plans to expand the number of the COVID-19 um, specialist centres, and if that is the case, um, how he intends to staff them, given uh, the pressures that GPs are currently under? I have no intention of expanding the current number. We have ten working across Northern Ireland at this moment in time. And as I say, the, the, the number of people attending those is increasing, uh, and the way they have been set up, they are done by local GP support as well, through local GP federations. So it is about making sure there is the buy-in and the support from the GPs in the local area for the COVID centres that all, are already working, and that the, the triage and of patients going to those COVID centres is appropriate as well and proportionate to the people who actually need there, to, as I said earlier, to make sure that anyone who has COVID centres isn't entering a GP practice um, alongside non-COVID or non-COVID symptomatic patients. Can I ask Justin McNulty? Thank the Minister for coming here today to speak with us and for his answers thus far. Um, I had to attend my own doctor's surgery this, during this pandemic in, the, in a heightened time of lockdown in McVeary and McAvoy in Uri, and uh, whilst GP surgeries, their modus operandi has been completely disrupted, I found it to be very efficient and very effective, and thankfully I didn't even have to see the doctor, I was just triaged via a nurse. But some people have contacted my offices and they're concerned by the fact that they haven't been consulting even with, with their doctor, they've been sharing their, their medical conditions with people who are not their doctor, which makes them feel uncomfortable, and others have contacted me about the delays in accessing their GPs, and that they haven't been specifically necessarily in Nuri and Armagh, but how can you give them people assurances about what they should expect going forward? And again, I thank the member, and I'm glad he had the experience that he had, because it is replicated by many people across Northern Ireland in support that the, the general GPs have been able to provide. The structure of general practice has been changing over the last number of years you know, with those multi-professional teams uh, and the change of roles of those who are actually working within the GP practice. So, As the member indicated in his own experience, it is not always necessary to see the GP. There may be somebody else in the team, should it be the nurse, um, should it be a physiotherapist, should it be a pharmacy, depending on where um, that GP practice is, should it be sitting as part of one of those multidisciplinary teams. So it's not always necessary when you phone a GP to talk to the GP, but it's making sure that the patients who you are contacting are triaged and signposted to the right individual to provide the right level of care that they need. Cameron Dolan. Liz Kimmins. Can Corden again thank the Minister for coming this afternoon um, to clarify on quite a number of issues I suppose that we're all getting at the minute and I think it highlights the vital service that the GP practices provide, and without them, the, the implications for other um, services, as, as one member rightly pointed out regarding A and E. Um, I just wanted to, to mention you would mentioned the need regarding additional PPE, and I know the BMA have expressed concerns about um, a second wave uh, potentially. Um, so it was just to ask the minister: um, Are you content that the systems are in place for PPE and contact tracing in the event of a second wave? And I thank the member. In regards to, to PPE, it's one of the things that um, 
our party colleague, the Minister in Finance, uh, and myself have been able to work very closely in regards to even looking to local manufacture of PPE so that we're not reliant um, solely on overseas provision. And one of the things that we have continued to do as a department is make sure that we have a stock of PPE. When we entered this pandemic, uh, back at the start of the year, our normal running procedure was to have four weeks' supply. We're now up to 12 weeks' supply, and that's where we continue to maintain that. Recently, I signed off on an additional um, business case for three additional warehouses so that we can ensure that we have that storage and stock pile of PPE. The supply chains that we were able to put into place for our GPs through our business service organisation um, proved effective. They were difficult, they were bumpy at the start, but when we got to being able to deliver to them, we were, we were getting them and meeting their needs. Um, and again, those continued supply lines are there, the PPE is there, so it's a piece of work that we continue to do. So that should we get into that second phase, and I still think um, I still think we can prevent it if we come together and work together uh, as a people across Northern Ireland with our health service, um, but those supply chains and those reassurances are there. And that concludes this item of business. Could I ask members just to take your ease for a moment or two? Thank you.